Good evening. Can you hear me? I'm Anita Obermeyer. I'm the chair of the English department and core faculty in the Institute for Medieval Studies. I was asked to do something that, in my opinion, does not need doing. <laughs> to introduce a person who does not need an introduction, at least not to this audience. I'm, however, both greatly humbled and honored that Tim Graham asked me to do it. When I was first hired at UNM, now donkeys years ago, Helen D'Amico initiated the search for the new institute director. It was somewhat intimidating to be on the search committee for the IMS director when I had only been here for a few months. I'm certain, however, you agree with me that bringing Tim Graham to the New Mexico desert and with him his incredible knowledge of manuscripts the professional study of paleography, and the tireless energy that has helped medieval studies gain even more prominence in the university and the state was one of the best hiring choices UNM has ever made. And you started clapping before I prompted you. <laughs> Even better. Students who have had the benefit of having Dr. Graham as readers of their theses and dissertations will probably add to this list of, of accomplishments his uncanny ability to spot an incorrectly italicized comma behind, <laughs> behind titles in their writing. <laughs> All kidding aside. The fact that medieval studies was the only humanities field termed excellent in the recent UNM higher education accreditation document is a further cap in our, and especially his cap. A further feather, sorry. <laughs> Educated at Cambridge University, the University of London, and the Warburg Institute, Dr. Graham is one of the world's premier experts in the study of medieval paleography. Both a UNM Regents and a UNM Distinguished Professor. Dr. Graham is the author of numerous, numerous articles as well as the author, editor, and co-editor of eight books. His books demonstrate diverse topics ranging from herbs and healers of, from the ancient Mediterranean through the medieval West, Elizabeth Elstop's English, English Saxon homily on the birthday of St. Gregory, the recovery of Old English, Anglo-Saxon studies in the 16th and 17th centuries, and the Bible as book, an exhibition of items from the Van Campen collection, to name a few. The Jewel and the Crown is, of course, the seminal, influential, and highly successful introduction to manuscript studies done with our other speaker this week, Ray Clements. Furthermore, Dr. Graham has been an invaluable resource for UNM students, he has served on many MA and PhD committees, especially in history and English. His biennial summer paleography course attracts many students from other universities to UNM. For his teaching prowess, Dr. Graham received the UNM College of Arts and Sciences Award for Teaching Excellence in 2010, and in 2016, the even more prestigious Medieval Academy of America's CARA Award for Teaching Excellence in Medieval Studies. That is one award a year per for, for the entire country. So it's an amazing uh, achievement. I feel both fortunate and privileged to have spent my time at UNM in the Graham era of IMS. When Dr. Graham last year announced his intention of stepping down, from the post as director that he has held for 17 years, a number of us prevailed on him to give the last lecture of this year's spring lecture series. And the topic is Rescuing the Medieval World, Matthew Parker, Sir Robert Cotton, and the Preservation of England's Past. I give you the wonderful, the iconic, the one of a kind, <laughs> Timothy Graham. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, my colleague and my friend, Anita Obermeyer. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me clearly? Is that my wife's April Fool? All right, I have found the source of it. I think I've shut it up. Um, just two points I wanted to make before the lecture gets underway. As you will have noticed, for the first As you will have noticed, for the first time ever, we are video recording uh, this year's lectures. We have a professional, Robin Rupe of uh, Volti Subito Productions, who's been doing that. And those lectures are going to be posted on the internet. There will be a link from our website. I anticipate the lectures will be up there within the next couple of weeks. So if you happen to have missed anything of this year's series, uh, um, would like to view it, you'll be able to do so. Go to the Institute website, which is very simple to remember, ims.unm.edu. Okay, one more time, ims.unm.edu. Um, and you will see a link there to where the lectures are posted. Second announcement. In England, we call this a torch, not a flashlight. And I have alarmed students in my classes on several occasions when I have told them how I study manuscripts with the help of a torch. <laughs> so this is a torch for me, not a flashlight. I am now passing the torch to my successor as director of the Institute for Medieval Studies. who will be Dr. Justine Andrews of UNM's Department of Art. The Institute is going to be in wonderfully capable hands. As this lecture series has demonstrated over its 34-year course, and still counting, we today know a tremendous amount about the medieval world, about its history, its literature, its religious practices, its science and medicine, its art. We know as much as we do largely because of the survival of so many medieval books, of handwritten, handwritten manuscripts, which we have across Western Europe in their tens of thousands. Those medieval books are the repositories of most of the knowledge that we have about the Middle Ages. And in the case of illuminated manuscripts, they are also the repositories of a large amount of medieval art. What I want to tell you today is that we are exceptionally fortunate to have as many books as we still do. Medieval books have undergone many adventures across the centuries. I'm going to begin by giving you three or four rather notable examples. So a number of you will know what the Lindisfarne Gospels is. It is a gospel book that was made in the far northeast of England on the tidal island of Lindisfarne in the early 8th century, around about 715 to 721. It has some of the most spectacular of all medieval artwork. It underwent an adventure 
in the ninth century. The monastery of Lindisfarne was actually the first place in Western Europe to be attacked by Vikings. That was in the year 793. The Vikings attacked Lindisfarne several more times over the following decades. A monastery located on a coast was a very easy target for the Vikings. By the 870s, the monks of Lindisfarne had got fed up of being attacked, and they therefore left Lindisfarne. They wandered across northern England for eight years looking for a new home, and at some point in the early 880s, they had gotten as far as the northwest coast of England, and they thought it would be a very good idea to migrate to Ireland. So, they boarded ship. They took their most precious possessions with them, which included the Lindisfarne Gospels. All of a sudden, a storm blew up as they were leaving port. The ship started to keel from side to side in the stormy weather, and then at some point, somehow, the Lindisfarne Gospels jumped ship. That is to say, it went overboard and sank. The monks were very distressed. <laughs> Amazingly, some time later, we don't know if it was days or weeks or months, the book washed up on the northern shore of the Solway Firth probably about 20 miles away from where it had got, gone under. The monks discovered it. Miraculously, it was undamaged. But they took this as a sign that they were not supposed to migrate to Ireland. <laughs> they were supposed to remain in England, and so they did. Another example of a gospel book, this one made in southern England, that was plundered by the Vikings. Uh, this gospel book was made in the ninth century. We call it the Codex Aureus, which means the golden book. The Vikings captured it, but then a nobleman whose name was Alfred ransomed it back from them. He gave them gold to get it back from them, and then he returned it to Canterbury Cathedral, to which it belonged. He recorded his ransoming back of the manuscript in that note that you see in the upper and lower margins of this page. And there are the two halves of the note. However, perhaps not surprisingly, before the Vikings gave it back to him, they stripped it of its precious binding, which would have consisted of precious metals and gemstones. So they kept the binding, but they gave back the book Alfred returned it to Canterbury. Perhaps the most famous medieval manuscript of all is the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells, probably made on the island of Iona around about the year 800. It's another copy of the Gospels in Latin. Um, and eventually, uh, the monks from Iona established a new monastery on the mainland of Ireland at Kells. The manuscript was kept there. In 1007, it was stolen by a thief from the sacristy at the Monastery of Kells. By great good fortune, it was discovered three months later under a sod of earth. The monks were able to get the Book of Kells back. But again, deprived of its binding, whoever stole it had stripped it of its precious binding and also, alas, of about 20 leaves from the beginning and end. We no longer have the first several leaves and the last leaves of the Book of Kells. Not all of the adventures undergone by medieval manuscripts happened in the Middle Ages. Let me give you one more example. The page you see on the screen is the first page of a manuscript that carries the earliest surviving copy of the first English laws, the laws of 7th century kings of Kent in the southeast of England. For legal historians, this manuscript is of incredible importance. Around the year 1715, the manuscript had been borrowed from its home at Rochester Cathedral 
by a scholar who was working in London and writing a history of Kent. The uh, cathedral community at Rochester allowed him to borrow the manuscript and to have it in London. When he had finished using it, he returned it to Rochester by ship. Alas, the ship capsized in stormy weather, and for several hours, this manuscript, its technical name is the Textus Rofensis, the text of Rochester, um, it was submerged in the water. You can see the signs of the water damage in that dark brown stain over the right area of this first page, and many other pages are stained as well. But fortunately, every single word of the text is still legible. So medieval books have undergone many adventures. But the greatest threat to the survival of England's medieval books came in the 16th century. It came as a result of a religious and political move by King Henry VIII. Henry VIII argued with the Pope because he wanted to divorce his wife Catherine of Aragon. The Pope didn't want to let him. And eventually, Henry VIII split the Church of England off from the Roman Catholic Church. As part of that process, he abolished all English monasteries in two phases. First of all, in 1536, he abolished the smaller monasteries, defined as those that had an income of less than 200 pounds a year. Three years later, in 1539, he abolished the rest, those with an income greater than 200 pounds a year. Altogether, through Henry's dissolution of the monasteries, as we call it, more than 800 monasteries were abolished. In many cases, their lands were bought from the crown by various English nobles. But what happened to the buildings? Often, the buildings were simply abandoned, left to go to ruin. So here, for example, I'm showing you the ruins of what was once a magnificent monastery in Yorkshire, Byland Abbey. What about the libraries and the books? Often the libraries were simply abandoned. So what was going to happen to the books? Well, many fates were possible for the contents of the libraries. In some cases, local collectors gathered them up to preserve them. Other books, we know, were exported to the European continent and disappeared, never to be seen again. In some cases, local tradespeople, like bakers and apothecaries, got their hands on the monastic books and then might tear leaves out of them to feed their fires or even to wrap their goods in, to wrap their loaves or to wrap their batches of pills. This was a perilous time, therefore, for the survival of England's medieval books. And I want to give you two examples that bring that to life. Here's my first example. The monastery of St. Augustine, just outside the walls of Canterbury, was dissolved in the second wave in 1539. Several years after it had been dissolved, a baker who was a former monk of the abbey returned to its buildings and happened to find among a heap of torn papers a magnificent copy of the works of the Greek poet Homer, written in Greek. Fortunately, he realized the value of this book, he rescued it, and he ended up giving it to Matthew Parker, who has recorded his name in the form Matthäus Cantuariensis, Matthew, Archbishop of Canterbury. So this copy of Homer, fortunate to survive. Now I'm going to tell you a real horror story. <laughs> in the early 8th century, 
at the monastery to which the great scholar, the Venerable Bede, had belonged, the monastery of Jarrow in the far northeast of England, three magnificent one-volume Bibles were produced. One of those Bibles was intended for the Pope in Rome. It survives intact to this day. It is a wonderfully historic volume. The other two were originally intended, one for the monastery of Jarrow itself, one for the sister monastery of Wearmouth about seven miles away. Nothing of those two other Bibles survives today apart from just 13 single leaves. Here is one of those leaves. If you look in the lower margin of the leaf, you can see that something is written upside down. What is written there tells us what happened to at least one of the other two Bibles. So let's turn this leaf around and take a look at what it says uh, written in a 16th century hand in that margin. So the text reads, copies of deeds and other writings relating to lands in Middleton, Coppington, Wigtoft. If we look even more closely at this leaf, notice that a portion of the original leaf has been cut out in this corner. Same happened in this corner. And those edges were then turned over. What has happened is that individual leaves were torn out of that magnificent Bible either the one intended for Jarrow or the one intended for Wearmouth. We're not sure which. Individual leaves were torn out and then used as wrappers for the estate documents of a noble family. And actually, the place names in that note tell us which noble family, because all of those place names there they're the names of villages that belonged in the 16th century to a family called the Willoughbys who lived in a country house at Wallerton Hall in Nottinghamshire in the North Midlands of England. So they just tore leaves out of the Bible and used those leaves to wrap their family documents in. Here is a second of those 13 leaves, and this one uh, has the note at the top copies of grants, etc., of lands in Kossel and Trowel, two other villages that belonged to this family. So England's medieval manuscripts underwent great peril as a result of the dissolution of the monasteries. If it were not for the efforts of inspired collectors of the later 16th and early 17th centuries, many of those manuscripts would have been lost and gone forever. So what I would like to present to you is the work of the two most important English collectors of this era. Matthew Parker, who became Queen Elizabeth's first Archbishop of Canterbury, a position he held from 1559 to 1575 when he died, and Sir Robert Cotton, who was an even more impressive collector than Parker, Cotton lived from 1571 to 1631. So we're going to take a look at how they managed to get their hands on medieval books and what these two scholars did with the books once they got them into their hands. We're going to deal with Parker first. Parker did not become aware of the threat to medieval books until he became Archbishop of Canterbury in 1559. He was advised on this by a member of the clergy at Canterbury called John Bale, who knew more about the fate of English medieval manuscripts than anyone else in the country. So he alerted Parker to what had happened as a result of the dissolution of the monasteries. Parker then set about trying to repair the damage, trying to find and collect medieval books. His initial method of doing so was to contact his network of bishops scattered throughout England 
and to ask his bishops to search in their diocese for any manuscripts, and if they found them, to send them to Parker. That's how he began in the early and mid-1560s. But then in 1568, um, he got a helping hand from Queen Elizabeth's Privy Council, that is to say, the body of her closest advisors, who issued an edict sent to all and sundry Her Majesty's subjects, an edict in which Elizabeth's subjects were commanded to hand over any medieval manuscripts they might have in their hands to Parker's agents. The actual words of the edict, um, subjects are told that when the archbishop shall send his learned deputies and shall request to have sight of any records or monuments written, being in your custody, at the contemplation of these our letters, you are gently to impart the same. <laughs> gently to impart the same is a polite way of saying, you better turn them over. <laughs> so, as a result, Parker was able to collect about 500 medieval manuscripts altogether. And he and those associated with him studied those manuscripts hard. Once he had the manuscripts in his hand, Parker established what we might think of as a research institute at the Archbishop of Canterbury's palace, which was located at Lambeth, Lambeth Palace on the south bank of the River Thames. Parker and members of his household who were scholars, they studied the manuscripts hard. They became interested in several specific issues. Parker rapidly realized that these medieval manuscripts actually could help to justify the stance that his church, the Reformed Protestant Church of England, the stance that it took against the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. Parker became interested in three specific issues for which the medieval manuscripts provided evidence. He was interested in whether or not it was legitimate for priests to marry. He himself was a Protestant priest. He was married. This was an important issue for him. He was also interested in how the ancient church had interpreted the Eucharistic elements, the bread and wine that were used in Holy Communion. Um, in accordance with Catholic doctrine, were they transubstantiated? That is to say, were they literally transformed in the, into the physical body and blood of Christ? Or did they become Christ's body and blood only in a spiritual, not a literal sense? And the third issue that Parker and his associates were interested in was whether it was appropriate and legitimate to use the vernacular, to use the English language in the church liturgy, uh, in church worship. So he found evidence for all of these issues in his manuscripts. And when he found such evidence, he would typically annotate the manuscripts. So what you see here is a passage of a Latin text written by an Anglo-Saxon author, written actually for a bishop to deliver to his clergy. And in this text, the bishop says to his clergy that he is not going to force them to abandon their wives. So the text proves some Anglo-Saxon clergy had had wives, and their bishop, in this case, was prepared to let them keep their wives. Key evidence for Parker. So what he has done, this is Parker's chubby, pointing hand drawn in the margin. And after he became archbishop, he loved to use the color red for his annotations. So he's uh, sketched in that red pointing hand. He has underlined the text in red. And then his principal associate, his secretary and also his chaplain, whose name was John Jocelyn, he's responsible responsible for this ink mark in the margin and for the ink underlining. There is both ink and red underlining there. Here's another later manuscript in which Parker found a reference to a member of the clergy who had been married, 
during the archbishopric of John Peacham, uh, who was Archbishop of Canterbury in the late 13th century. So once again, passages of interest to Parker, he underlines it, and he writes the comment in the margin, it's Latin, but I'll translate it, a married cleric in the days of John Peacham, Archbishop of Canterbury. So Parker scoured his manuscripts for evidence of clerical marriage. And he compiled all that evidence as an appendix to a book that he published in 1568 called A Defense of Priests' Marriages. So the work itself is a treatise saying it's okay for priests to marry. In the appendix, Parker compiled all the evidence for clerical marriage during the medieval period that he'd found in his manuscripts. Now, a good number of the manuscripts that Parker collected were written in the Old English language, the original form of the English language that had been used by the Anglo-Saxons, but that by Parker's time had long been a dead language. Knowledge of Old English really started to die out in a big way as early as the 1200s. Parker had about 70 Anglo-Saxon manuscripts. They were of especial importance to him because they were ancient, because they provided evidence for the earliest practices of the church in England. But how was he going to learn what they had to say? How were he and his associates going to learn the Old English language in order to crack open the meaning of these manuscripts written in Old English. The note that he wrote in the lower margin of this manuscript gives us the answer. That note means, in this book, the Saxon language can be learned rather easily. He wrote that note in the lower margin of a bilingual manuscript a bilingual copy of the Rule of St. Benedict, the great rule for monks and nuns that was observed throughout the Middle Ages. The copy that Parker had got his hands on had both Benedict's original Latin, and then following each individual Latin chapter, its Old English translation. So this is the end of Latin chapter 1, this is the beginning of the Old English translation of chapter 1. Parker used the Latin, a language he and his associates were expert in, to decipher the meaning of the Old English. When they did that, they were using this manuscript for exactly the opposite purpose for which it had originally been made. That Old English translation was made in order to facilitate less learned Anglo-Saxon monks and nuns to learn the rule of St. Benedict. Their Latin wasn't good, they needed the Old English translation. For Parker, it was the opposite. To begin with, he had no Old English. He needed the Latin to open up the meaning of the Old English. So that's how he and his guys learned Old English. Having learned a bit of Old English, Parker was delighted to find a sermon for delivery on Easter Day that had been written by a most orthodox, highly Catholic Anglo-Saxon author whose name was Alfrich, most prolific author of the early 11th century in England. As Parker saw it, Alfrich's homily for Easter Day showed that Alfrich and the Anglo-Saxon church had not believed in literal transubstantiation that their belief was that the body and blood of Jesus was represented only in a spiritual sense by the bread and wine of Holy Communion. So, Parker found this sermon. He believed it to be so important that he decided to publish it in what became a historic publication. In 1566, Parker published this Anglo-Saxon sermon in a little book, it's only of small dimensions, that he gave the title A Testimony of Antiquity, because this sermon served as a witness to the practices of the Anglo-Saxon church, demonstrating 
but they had not believed in transubstantiation. So this is the title page. Here is the opening of the sermon itself. We have the Old English printed on the left-hand page. Almost nobody in 16th century England could understand Old English, so we have a 16th century translation on the right-hand page. Let's take a closer look at the Old English. Parker had a very skilled type designer. He actually had to find this person in France. There was nobody good enough in England. He had a very skilled type designer design letter forms that represented the way Anglo-Saxons themselves had written the letters of the alphabet. So, for example, this letter here, this is an Anglo-Saxon letter form that we call ETH, E-T-H. It represents the T-H sound. This letter is an Anglo-Saxon form of F. It is low set. This is S. This one is G. So, special font created for the publication of this sermon. This is a historic moment in uh, the history of typography. Parker was also delighted to find that the Anglo-Saxons had made their own translation of the four Gospels. This was important for Parker because the Church of England, like other Protestant churches, believed that it was okay to use the vernacular in church and to read out from the Bible in vernacular translation for the readings at the Eucharist. So Parker managed to find four copies of the Gospels in Old English. The one that he valued most was the one I'm showing you part of a page of. The reason he valued this manuscript so highly was because of title lines like this written in red. So that title line is telling us something about the reading that follows. That title means this is for the third Sunday after Epiphany. This is the gospel reading read out in church on the third Sunday of Epiphany. This manuscript proved to Parker that the Anglo-Saxons had used the vernacular language in church services, and this justified what was going on in the 16th century when the English church and German Protestant churches were similarly using vernacular translations in church. So again, this was a very important discovery for Parker, so important that in 1571, he published an edition of the Four Gospels in Old English, and this is another historic moment in the history of printing. This was the first time that any part of the Bible had been published in the Old English language. Let's move on to Cotton. Cotton, who actually was a collector on an even larger scale than Parker. Um, whereas Parker collected about 500 manuscripts, Cotton's collection was more like 1,000 manuscripts. So before we look at his books, let me tell you a little bit about Cotton's life. He was born in 1571 to members of the minor nobility um, in the English provinces, a little bit north of Cambridgeshire. He discovered that his family was actually descended from the 14th century Scottish king, Robert the Bruce. He became exceptionally proud of that heritage. And in the 1590s, when it was becoming clear that the next monarch of England was going to be King James of Scotland, in the 1590s, Cotton started to incorporate his Brucian heritage into his signature. Okay, in the 1590s, he starts to sign his name Robert Cotton Brucius. There he's doing it in the year 1599. Immensely proud of that heritage. But let's go back to his boyhood. As a boy, Cotton was sent by his father to be educated in London at Westminster School, where the headmaster was William Camden. William Camden, the most learned antiquary of the Tudor age and perhaps throughout English history. 
It must have been while Cotton studied with Camden at Westminster that he developed his love for the past. And when he was only 17 years old, he started to collect manuscripts. It was in the year 1588 that Cotton acquired his first three medieval manuscripts. And he was so proud of them that he not only entered his name in each of the three, but also the date, 1588, and also the fact that he was 17 years old. <laughs> so he begins collecting in 1571. He continued collecting throughout the rest of his life. And he didn't only collect manuscripts. He also collected coins. He collected seals. He collected statues. He was even overjoyed on one occasion when he managed to find the fossil of a fish. He collected anything that could tell him about the past. So he was a much more voracious collector than Parker. And let's say a little bit to make that point in more detail, um, that he collected more and ultimately better than did Parker. So some examples. Parker had not succeeded in collecting any Anglo-Saxon copy of Bede's ecclesiastical history of the English people, the most important work of Anglo-Saxon history, which Bede wrote in Latin. Um, Parker did not manage to find an Anglo-Saxon copy. He did find a ma later medieval copy. Cotton managed to get his hands on two Anglo-Saxon copies of Bede, of which this is one. Parker managed to collect only one manuscript of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which is the second most important source for Anglo-Saxon history. There are seven manuscripts of the Chronicle altogether. Parker got only one, Cotton got five. Here we're looking at the very end of one of Cotton's copy. This is the annal for the year 1066, which describes how Duke William came from Normandy and conquered the English, and the last comment in this copy is, and always after that, it grew much worse. <laughs> Parker did not collect a single copy of Magna Carta, the document that records the liberties of the individual and that was signed by King John in 1215. Parker didn't have one. Cotton got his hands on two copies of Magna Carta, I will be talking about why that one looks burned a little bit later on. Cotton's interests were actually more eclectic than Parker's. Parker was mostly interested in religious history. Cotton was interested in that, but he was interested in much more than that. He was interested in politics. He was interested in law. He had a greater aesthetic sense than Parker as well. Parker didn't particularly like to collect manuscripts that had artwork. Cotton did. Here's an example. It was Cotton, not Parker, who collected um, the most lavishly illustrated manuscript produced in Anglo-Saxon times. It was an Old English translation of the first six books of the Old Testament. Uh, we call it the Hexateuch. It has over 400 illustrations. Cotton loved that manuscript. He collected that decorated manuscript along with many others. What did he do with his manuscripts? First of all, where did he store them? In 1622, Cotton bought a new residence. It was situated within the Palace of Westminster complex on the north bank of the River Thames. Now, that same Palace of Westminster complex at this time housed the English Houses of Parliament. The House of Commons actually was located in this chapel, the Chapel of St. Stephen. The House of Lords, they sat in this building. The residence that Parker, uh, that uh, Cotton bought within the complex, we can't see in the illustration, it's behind, but it was immediately adjacent to the House of Commons and not far within a few yards of the House of Lords. 
That's where Cotton located his library. So he called the residence that he bought Cotton House. His library he put on the second floor of Cotton House. This is a modern artist's reconstruction of what Cotton's library looked like. It was a long and narrow room. It was about 38 feet long by six feet wide. In the library room, there were 13 bookcases and one large chest. On the top of each bookcase and on the chest, Parker put a bronze bust of a Roman emperor or a Roman imperial woman. He had somehow collected 14 bronze busts. Twelve were of the emperors from Julius Caesar to Domitian, and then there were two women, Cleopatra and Faustina. So, in the artist's reconstruction, you can see the bronze busts. To this day, that has led to the shelf marks by which cotton manuscripts are known. If you go to the British Library today and you want to summon up the Lindisfarne Gospels, what you actually have to ask for is manuscript Cotton Nero D4. <laughs> if you want to get that highly illustrated Old English Hexateuch, you have to ask for manuscript Cotton Claudius B4. The shelf marks are very precise. So that shelf mark for the Lindisfarne Gospels, Nero D4, it means that Cotton kept it in the bookcase that had the bust of Nero on top of it, that he kept it on shelf D, the fourth shelf from the top, A, B, C, D, and that he kept it in the fourth position on that shelf, counting from the left. That's how Cotton organized his library. What about how he used the library or allowed it to be used? His attitude was essentially different from Parker's. Remember, Parker set up a research institute for himself and his research associates. He did not make his collection generally available. Cotton's attitude was very different. He wanted his library to be a national resource. He wanted people to come in and study in his library. This actually got him in trouble at one point in the later 1620s. Given the library's proximity to the Houses of Parliament, politicians kept coming into the library to consult volumes to get political precedents. And this was a time of political instability in England, when King Charles I was trying to become an absolute monarch and Parliament was trying to prevent him. One of the ways they tried to prevent him was by looking for examples of earlier English kingship in Cotton's library. So there actually came a point in 1629 when the Crown shut down Cotton's library for several months so that people would not be able to use it. Not only politicians, also Cotton wanted to make his library available to scholars. So the very best scholars of this time period would make a pilgrimage to London in order to consult Cotton's library. Let me give you two examples of such scholars. One was James Usher, the Archbishop of Armagh in Ireland. Usher wrote a magnificent history of the British church. A great deal of the information for that history he obtained from manuscripts in the Cotton library. Usher may be a name that is known to you. This is the guy who, by carefully studying the Bible, calculated that the world had been created on October 23rd of the year 4004 BC, around about six o'clock in the evening. <laughs> Another scholar who used Cotton's library was someone who has been described as the most learned man in 17th century England. Uh, his name was John Selden. He was especially interested in law. He wrote several treatises on the law, and he got his material for those treatises from uh, documents that he found in Cotton's library. 
So open was the access to Cotton's library that one contemporary described it like this. The doors of the library. The doors, like those of the muses, according to Pindar, are open to all. In witness whereof, I call theologians, antiquaries, lawyers, booksellers, who all have drunk their fill without expense or trouble from the Cotton Library as from an everlasting common spring. Now, Cotton didn't, didn't only allow scholars to come in and use the books in the library itself. He also allowed scholars to borrow books from the library and take them home to study at leisure. He kept a record of his loans. He had a book in which he recorded the loans. Here is a portion of a page of that book in which he is recording the loan of one, two, three manuscripts to a Mr. Lyle of Cambridge. There was a downside to his generosity. Not all of the books that he loaned came back to him. It's actually true of one of the books in this list of three that now is in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, whereas it ought to be in the Cotton Library, which is part of the British Library in London. It is also spectacularly true of what was one of the most beautiful manuscripts in Cotton's collection a manuscript that we call the Utrecht Psalter. So this is a copy of the Book of Psalms, only the Book of Psalms, that was made in France around about the 820s. Every single one of the 150 Psalms is preceded by a line drawing, like the one you see here. Alas, Cotton loaned this beautiful Psalter to Francis Howard, Earl of Arundel, who in the political instability of the 1620s was forced into exile in the Netherlands. He never came back to England. When he died in the Netherlands, his wife sold the manuscript and ultimately it was acquired by the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. That's where it is today when it should be in the Cotton Library. It is the most valuable book in the Netherlands. Well, we've seen that Cotton and Parker chose to do different kinds of things with their collections. Parker preferred to keep the books to himself. Cotton preferred to allow others to use them. But my major point is that through their activities, they preserved a very large number of extremely important books that otherwise we would not have, and thereby we would have been deprived of a great deal of knowledge of England's medieval past. But the fact that they collected and preserved these manuscripts is not the end of the story. So in this last part of my presentation, I want to tell you some perils that the books that Parker and Cotton collected have undergone since their owner's deaths. A little bit first of all about Parker's manuscripts. As Parker was approaching his death, he decided he was gonna leave his collection to one of the Cambridge colleges, Corpus Christi College, of which he had been the master before he became Archbishop of Canterbury. He thought that was the safest place for the manuscripts to be kept. So following his death, they were all taken to Cambridge, given to Corpus Christi College, a new library room was created to house them. Here is the first page of one of Parker's manuscripts now being kept at Corpus Christi College in Cambridge. Notice the damage to the upper right edge of this leaf. And I want to tell you that every single leaf has exactly the same form of damage in this manuscript. And the damage has removed part of a note written by Parker in which he speculated, actually totally wrongly, that this manuscript had been the work of his predecessor as Archbishop of Canterbury, Theodore of Tarsus, a Greek 
who came to England uh, in the seventh century and was archbishop for 30 years in the seventh century. So he was wrong in his speculation. The damage has eaten through part of that note. So the damage occurred after the manuscript left Parker's hands. What do you think caused it? Every leaf has been damaged like this in this manuscript. It is rodent damage, okay, rats or mice. So at some point, the library at Corpus Christi College had been infested by rodents. It affected not only this manuscript. The manuscript it affected most spectacularly was this one. A copy of a great work, The Consolation of Philosophy, written by the early 6th century author Boethius. Alas, every single leaf of this Boethius manuscript has now been reduced to a fragment like that. I used to work in this library. I was a member of a research team there from 1989 to 1994. If we wanted to refer to this manuscript, we would refer to Boethius meets the mice. <laughs> what about Cotton's collection? What happened to it? What perils did it undergo? Let me first of all tell you what happened to the collection after Cotton's death in 1731. He bequeathed it to his son, who at his death turned it over to his son, the original Cotton's grandson. When that one died in 1702, he bequeathed the entire collection to the British nation. He wanted it to actually fulfill his grandfather's wish that the collection become a national resource. So that was in 1702. In 1753, the British Museum was founded and the whole cotton collection became one of what we call the foundation collections of the British Museum. As soon as the British Museum was created, the cotton collection was shifted into it. But what about the period between 1702, when the grandson died, and 1753, when the museum was founded? Well, the library had several different homes in London during that period. And at one point in the early 1730s, it was being kept in a large house close to Westminster School, a house ominously named Ashburnham House. <laughs> and on the night of 22nd to 23rd October 1731, a fire broke out in the Cotton Library in Ashburnham House. This fire destroyed some manuscripts totally. It virtually destroyed many other manuscripts of which now only severely burned fragments remain. This is one of those manuscripts. These are fragments of Otho C5. There are more fragments from this manuscript, but they are all looking something like this. Other manuscripts were burned only slightly around the edges, and thankfully, there were a few hundred that escaped unscathed. What could be done with the damaged manuscripts after the fire? This slide shows you what had happened to several of the manuscripts. Medieval manuscripts are made of parchment. Parchment is made of animal skin. Animal skin is glutinous. The heat of the fire had caused the sticky gluten in the parchment to make the leaves of some of the manuscripts congeal together like this. This one manuscript has been left deliberately unconserved, deliberately untouched, so we can see the fate that befell a good number of the manuscripts through the cotton fire. For decades, Nobody could devise a way to do anything to make manuscripts like this legible again. Not before they were moved into the British Museum, not even for several decades after they were moved into the British Museum. Then finally, in the 1820s, the assistant keeper of manuscripts at the British Museum, his name was Josiah Forshall, 
he devised a method to separate the leaves of books like this. This is what his method was. Uh, he would first of all cut the book into portions, okay? He'd take a knife and cut it into slices, basically, carefully between leaves. Then he would soak those portions in a solution of water and spirits of zinc. And that soaking would cause the leaves to separate. Once they were separated, he would flatten them out. In order to flatten them out fully, he had to make some incisions uh, in the margins and between the lines. Okay, he actually gives us a description that tells you exactly what I've just told you, but it's complicated, so I'm going to read it out so you get a, an exact idea of how he did this. So manuscripts like this were first carefully divided into convenient portions, and these were severally immersed for a longer or shorter time in that solution of spirits of zinc and water, as they appeared more or less scorched. This immersion under very partial application of hot water made it practicable to separate the leaves without any material injury. By making incisions between the columns and lines of writing, thus making room for an expansion of the parts most shriveled and contracted by the fire, and by subsequently applying a gentle pressure until the moisture was evaporated, the leaves have been rendered sufficiently flat and smooth to admit of the contents being read, for the most part, with great facility. Here's an example. This is a leaf of a manuscript that was treated by Forshall in this way. This is a very important manuscript. This is a manuscript that has the earliest text describing British history. The text is called The Ruin of Britain. It was written by a 5th century and early 6th century British scholar whose name was Gildas. He called his work The Ruin of Britain because he was so upset that the Anglo-Saxons had invaded Britain from the European continent and pretty much tried to boot the native British out. So, very important manuscript for what it tells us about British history. It was soaked, it was flattened out, and in order to ease the flattening out, Forshall, or the craftsman who worked for him, has made these incisions. Okay? That's exactly the process that he had described. So, a lot of the manuscripts were separated and flattened out in this way. Their leaves were then kept as separate leaves stored in boxes. If scholars came to the British Museum and wanted to study one of these manuscripts, they were given the box and they would then handle the individual leaves. This was not good. <laughs> because of the fire, the edges of the leaves were brittle. And as a result of scholars handling them, the edges started to crumble away. In some cases, removing some actual letters of text. So now we got another problem. Having separated the leaves and flattened them, is there anything that can be done to make them safe to be handled by scholars. It took a few more years for that problem to be solved. Then in the year 1842, a very skilled Oxford bookbinder came to the British Museum to describe a method he had devised to safeguard leaves like this in the cotton collection. Goff called his method inlaying the leaves. And this one I do not have a contemporary written description for you, so I'm going to do my best to describe it in my own words. Goth's method began by him getting a bit of tracing paper. He would lay the tracing paper over one of the flattened leaves. He would make an exact tracing of the contours of that medieval leaf. Then, he would get a piece of thicker construction-type paper, and he would lay his tracing paper down on the construction paper, and he would cut a hole in the construction paper 
the exact shape of the medieval leaf. But when he cut his hole using the tracing paper, he would cut just inside the line of the tracing so that when he laid the medieval leaf into the hole that had been created, there would be a tiny bit of overlap around the edge. Okay? There would be some overlap, and then he fastened the medieval leaf to the construction paper by using isinglass paper, of which you can see some strips there. What is isinglass paper? It was made by boiling up sturgeon's bladders. <laughs> and basically, isinglass paper was the Victorian equivalent of scotch tape. <laughs> so, it took Goff 14 years, from 1842 to 1846, to use this process of inlaying on all the cotton manuscripts whose leaves had been separated and flattened by Forshaw. One of the manuscripts he treated was the manuscript that contains the great classic of Old English literature, the Beowulf poem. So, fortunately, the Beowulf poem had been damaged only slightly around the edges by the cotton fire, but this was a book that scholars really wanted to study. As they handled the loose leaves uh, created by Forshaw, letters were crumbling away from the edges of pages. Goff secured the Beowulf manuscript for posterity by inlaying its leaves. So what is my takeaway message here? It is that thanks to the efforts of inspired collectors like Parker and Cotton, many manuscripts have been preserved for us and thanks to the efforts of highly skilled craftsmen like Goff, even manuscripts that subsequently became damaged have been secured for the future. We are immensely fortunate. We are in their debt. Here in New Mexico, we are incredibly fortunate that we have a community that is so interested in the Middle Ages and the medieval world. So I just want to end by paying tribute to you who for year after year have attended this lecture series and made my job worthwhile. I express my profoundest gratitude to you. Thank you. For those of you who were here last night, that was not all done in the last 22 and a half hours. <laughs> we have time for questions. Yes? Did Cotton finance his collection himself or did he have any backing? He actually did use his own resources um, he inherited from his father, but also on his mother's side. And I've actually read recently that it was the money he inherited from his mother uh, that he used for his manuscript acquisitions. Good question. Yeah. What, how was it written that it didn't dissolve in water? How was it written that it didn't dissolve in water? Um, long answer or short answer? Let's give you a middling answer. <laughs> Medieval ink was great. Um, there are several different medieval recipes for making ink, but the best recipe and the one that was widely used was a recipe for what we call iron gall ink. So this form of ink, it is a very dark brown ink. It is made by grinding up oak galls. What are oak galls? They are the globes 
that grow on the branches of oak trees when the gallfly lays its egg in the bud of, an oak, of, a, of a branch of an oak tree. Okay? You know those globes that the oak forms? That is how they are formed. Oak galls are high in tannic acid, which is a great constituent for ink. So you grind up the oak galls, you combine them with two or three other ingredients, uh, typically wine and copperas, which is iron sulfate and gum arabic. That makes a great ink that actually can withstand submersion in water. Okay? So, yeah, that's my middling answer to your question. <laughs> Art. Yeah. Is there any indication that you know of that 21st century methods of conservation that have done that better? So this is a really good question. So he's saying that when you do archaeology, uh, typically an archaeologist is interested in one period of history but may uncover things from other periods of history. So you want to rebury the material you're not interested in. You don't want to remove and destroy it. Is there anything similar um, in the case of manuscripts? Um, that is to say, is there any way that what was done in the 19th century could be looked at again now and perhaps done better? Is that the basic question? Okay, right. So this is a problem for modern conservationists. Um, when I worked in Cambridge, the name of our project was the Archaeology of Anglo-Saxon Manuscripts. And our research team consisted of three scholars, but then we also had a conservator who worked closely with us. And the conservator was very interested in using what are called non-destructive methods to conserve a manuscript. Anything you do should be reversible, so that if later on in time a better method is devised to solve the problem you're addressing, you can reverse what you've just done, and those people in the future can do it better. Um, that is an important principle of modern conservation. What Goff did has actually created some current problems because vellum and construction paper react differently to atmospheric changes. Okay? And as a result of that, in some of the manuscripts, the um, parchment leaf inlaid into the paper is beginning to cockle, a word Anne-Marie used last night, to cockle and pull away from the paper. So at the British Library in London now, they are trying to devise a method actually to undo some of what Goff had done and do it better with the knowledge we have now. It was a good question. Um, so I can easily miss questions at the back. Yeah, there you go. Yes, yes. Those manuscripts of cotton that are out there now, like the Utrecht Psalter, um, like the one that he loaned to Mr. Lyle that is now in the Bodleian Library, Oxford, the answer is largely no, and I think the British Library is not particularly interested um, in trying to recover them. But I want to tell you something in the reverse direction. The Lindisfarne Gospels got into cotton's hands, it's in the British Library. The Lindisfarne community that tried to migrate to Ireland eventually, in the year 995, ended up at Durham in the north of England. There is a magnificent cathedral at Durham. That's where the community finally settled. In recent years, Durham Cathedral has been trying to persuade the British Library to give the Lindisfarne Gospels back to Durham. So far without success but they are keeping on trying. So am I correct in assuming or understanding that that, that uh, bilingual edition of the Rule of Benedict, among others, are kind of Rosetta Stones? And were it not for those yes. and Parker's work, Old English would be almost completely lost to us, am I right? Really good observation. So his point is that bilingual manuscript of the Rule of St. Benedict that Parker used to decipher the meaning of Old English by looking at the Latin, his question is, are manuscripts like that a kind of Rosetta Stone? 
That is exactly the analogy to make. Okay? It is by using those bilingual manuscripts that Parker and other scholars of the 16th and 17th centuries learned Old English. John Jocelyn, Parker's associate, who was actually his main expert on Old English, by studying these kinds of manuscripts, he compiled a dictionary of Old English, and his dictionary has about 20,000 entries in it. He carefully went through these kinds of bilingual manuscripts. He put down an Old English word in his dictionary. He looked for the Latin translation. He wrote the Latin next to it. Sometimes he'd then also add the 16th century English version of the word. Yeah, that's exactly the way that process worked. George. So after the dissolution of the monasteries, was the sense of history so different that people generally didn't realize the significance of wrapping estate papers in pages of the Bible, or was this a deliberate act of mm -hmm. uh, disrespect? Okay. Or yeah, so the question is, at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries, was people's sense of history, and I guess you mean common people's sense of history, so different from ours that people like bakers and apothecaries would be willing to use the leaves of old books to wrap their goods in. Um, I do not know today how strong people in general sense of history is. Everyone gathered here has a strong sense of history and would never do something like that. But think if um, somebody who is not a scholar happens to discover perhaps a slightly damaged 19th century book, they probably wouldn't value it particularly highly. Um, so I'm kind of skirting around your question because I'm not quite sure how to answer it directly, um, but the answer is somewhat complex. I want to add one more insight into the way people felt about books um, in this early modern period after the dissolution. So you will have noticed my slide showing Parker and Jocelyn making annotations. Pretty much every early modern scholar felt that they were justified in making notes in manuscripts that they studied. This included somebody that I'm currently studying, Abraham Wheelock, who was the first person to hold a university professorship in Anglo-Saxon at Cambridge in the 1630s through the early 1650s, at the same time as he was Cambridge University librarian. Okay? One of his jobs was to look after the university's manuscripts, but he is one of the most furious scribblers in the margins of manuscripts. <laughs> you cannot do that today. Yeah. So, your first question about scribbling in manuscripts, have I said enough to answer that in my answer to the last question? So, part of it was an issue of ownership. In Parker's case, he was the owner of the manuscripts. He had rescued them. As he was the owner, I think he felt entitled to write in them. But not everybody who wrote in a medieval manuscript in this period was an owner. Um, so that's not a complete solution to uh, that issue. Okay, your second question, what explains Henry VIII's attitude? How could he have done this? How could he have abolished all the monasteries? Um, in part, it was because he got what we might think of as bad advice. Um, the person who really put him up to this um, was Thomas Cromwell, and also, Economics is an explanation. Um, Henry VIII was a big spender. Dissolving all the monasteries was a major way to get a lot of money in his hands because they then all belonged to the crown and the crown sold them off to buyers of the lands. So actually, Henry got himself out of a lot of debt as a result of the dissolution of the monasteries. Yeah, Barbara. Yeah. Um, was there two that he had, or were both damaged? So, excellent question. Cotton did have two copies of the Magna Carta. Yeah. 
The second one, fortunately, is undamaged, okay? It's only one, they happen to be stored separately. So only one of them uh, got charred in the fire. It is, alas, illegible, okay? But we do have the second copy that he had in his collection, which is undamaged. Yeah, Dennis. So, okay, so the question is about the Book of Kells, um, which got stolen and was then rediscovered. How come it had not been severely damaged? It was not submerged exactly. It was found under a sod of earth, okay? To this day, some leaves, of, uh, quite a lot of leaves of the Book of Kells are somewhat stained, okay? But it wasn't actually submerged in water. It was under a sod, it got stained, um, but the text is still legible. However, your question prompts me to think, how come the Lindisfarne Gospels is undamaged? When that went into the sea in a storm and ended up on the opposite uh, side of the Solway Firth, we believe that precious books like the Lindisfarne Gospels were often stored in cases, okay? And actually, in Victorian times, they created a case for the Lindisfarne Gospels, believing that probably in Anglo-Saxon times, it had a similar case. So my theory is that the Lindisfarne Gospels, when it went overboard, was actually inside a case, and it was that case that protected it from being severely damaged by the water. Yes. So, yeah. All right. Again, um, should we have the long answer, the short answer, or the middling answer? <laughs> Books in the Middle Ages were not given clasps until about the 13th century. So the German Bibles that you have seen with clasps, I am betting that they probably date from the 14th or 15th centuries, okay? Um, the function of those clasps was to counteract the natural springiness of parchment, okay? Parchment is springy. Without a clasp, the front of the book tends to open up a little bit. That's why they started to put clasps on books. Um, of course, once a book was clasped, that would indeed potentially help to better protect it against submersion in water. So yes, your point there is a good one. Anne-Marie. So you're talking about the early modern researchers, yes? Um, yeah, in, in, in the period of Carterson. Yeah, okay. So researchers in the early modern period, the later 16th and 17th centuries, who used the Cotton manuscripts and the Parker manuscripts, how did they cite their sources? You mean how did they cite the min manuscripts they were studying? Usually by describing it in a phrase, like the book of Genesis with pictures that is owned by Sir Robert Cotton. Yeah. We are done, everybody. Thank you so, so much.